Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone to NTRI's fourth summer seminar of 2022. Each week in July and August, we'll be hosting a talk on the biodiversity and conservation of Gespolik, Southwest Nova Scotia. My name is Morgan Snare, and I'm a summer research assistant here at the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that NTRI is in, and we are meeting from Gespolik, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship, and we thank the Mi'kmaq people for sharing their generosity and their homeland with us. NTRI is a research-based nonprofit nestled in Southwest Nova Scotia near Kegi National Park and historic site, and within the Southwest Nova Scotia Biosphere Reserve. Our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity in Gesplik and beyond. Tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Nick Hill, coordinator of the Southwest Nova Biosphere Reserve. Next, I will hand the seminar over to Nick, but I would like to remind everyone to keep, please keep your mics muted. And if you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the chat window or wait till the question period at the end. With that, Nick, you can feel free to take over. Thank you, Morgan. Um, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, one of the possible titles is the value of rarity or you know, what's it good for? Uh, often when we're working with rare species, it, we feel that it's esoteric. We are confronted with people who have to make a living and we start getting apologetic. So these are things that have been going through my head for the last uh, 10 years. And I uh, came to a head when I was headed for a seminar and realized, well, why, why do these students want to listen about the Plymouth Gentian and uh, how rare it is and how cool it is? Or the Long's bulrush, which um, will only flower every hundred years if it gets fire, and if it doesn't, it'll just stay dormant or vegetative. Or here's David Garbery, and I studied um, blue cohosh. Why should students be interested? Why should anyone be interested? Why should an electrician who's uh, done a hard day's work and is just meeting me on a ferry be interested that I'm studying the Eastern Mountain Avens? And so that's really my conundrum, and probably a few of yours as well. So in 1973, the Endangered Species Act in the USA listed the values of rare species. One thing that stands out to all of us is when they're, ooh, ah, and they're aesthetically pleasing, like the showy lady slipper, or to some of us, the uh, Eastern ribbon snake. And apart from the aesthetics, there's a lot of, reasons which are um, not academic, but they're educational, historic, recreation, we can understand that, scientific or part of the nation's heritage. But I'm going to sp uh, spend more time looking at the ecological reasons for thinking that there is a value in rare species. Rare species may have ecological, sorry, may have unique functional attributes and function in places where other plants can't. Uh, this summer and last summer, um, we've been looking at the black ash and recognizing that here's a plant that is truly a wetland tree, although it can grow in uplands and does in New Brunswick and on some of our floodplains, but when it gets into a good deep peat swamp, it has lenticels, sometimes it has a flared trunk, and it's clearly operating at anaerobic levels that other trees can't. We measured the distance to water table this year in the spring and found that it was 21 centimeters below, the base of its trunk was 21 centimeters below the red maple. So it was operating at levels that the red maple and other plants couldn't. We could do the same analysis with um, the um, sebacea, uh, Plymouth gentian, and find that it was photosynthesizing at deep levels that other plants couldn't. Paul Caddy uh, did a lot of work with the, um, with the Atlantic coastal plain plants and found them to be the most stress tolerant. And when he started looking at, this is a picture on the left of a, of a lake shore, when he started looking at those plants, deep on the lake shore, they started more and more of them to be rare. And therefore it seems that when the proportion of the, of the ecological community is composed of rare plants, obviously these are um, pulling 
most of the weight. They're doing most of the um, photosynthesis and erosion control. And this is what these lakeshores are looking like. And the pink here is the Plymouth Gentian. These are the overwinter rosettes, which look like little cabbages. And it gets around by having floating seeds. It's a G2 plant, which is globally um, very rare, and it's endangered in Canada. Other studies have found that when you look at who's doing the heavy lifting or who's doing the, the functions that other organisms can't in coral reefs or alpine meadows or tropical rainforests, that more than you would expect, it's the rare and uncommon species. That when you get into these systems, that there are non-redundant functions that this, um, this Muyat, Muyat uh, et al. paper was talking about that are done by the rare or the uncommon. But we tend to idealize and protect the rare and we get up on a high horse and it's good to get up on high horses so you get a good view. But you know, sometimes we wonder, you know, why all the fuss about the rare? The showy lady slipper, the, um, the black ash, and um, this Dorcas copper in Cape Breton. And we disdain the weedy, Plantago major, um, all around the world, Digitaria, Bulbostylus. Sam Van der Kloot, my mentor, my uh, botanical mentor, sort of looked at species over evolutionary time and had a feeling that the rare would get their time in time to come and that their all species went through cycles. They were rare and then they might become common. And then when they're about to blink out, they become rare again. The UN Convention on Biodiversity talks about the importance of preserving the evolutionary process. And here we've been studying David Garbery and I again, and a whole host of people that were um, involved in the restoration of Big Meadow Bog, um, led by Environment Canada, Environment Climate Change Canada, and the Department of Natural Resources um, and Renewables. They, we've been studying this plant and look at its geological or geographic range in the White Mountains up high and 6,000 feet and at sea level in Nova Scotia. Clearly, there's a very interesting evolutionary process, an interesting tale that involves the ice ages, the Pleistocene, repeated glaciations, and it's on its last legs. But what about the next glaciation? Can it get to the next glaciation? And can we, can we help it get over that hump? So we're wanting to preserve evolutionary process as well. Deborah Rabinovich, suggested that there were seven ways that you could have rarity. And these things were um, combinations of the geographic range, if it's small or large, the local population density, is it a dense population or sparse, and whether the organism is a generalist or a specialist. What I showed you earlier, Long's bulrush has a small range. It's a pine barrens plant. It has large local populations in, in Nova Scotia, but it has a very narrow habitat breadth. That's one of the way that species can be rare. And if we look at these different combinations, we can say we can make a column for generalists, a column for specialists. And then on the left-hand side, we can th think that there are ranges that are large and that there are ranges that are small and then we can separate these things into dense local populations, sparse local populations. When these two authors did it, they found that 74% of all rare plants are specialists. Generalists are weedy. Specialists tend to be more the rare organisms. When I did the sim a similar thing with our rare species, rare, I should say rare plant species, and we could do the same with the ribbon snake, we could put Blanding's turtle in here. And I imagine we'd get to the same conclusion. We could put the moose in here. 
Um, it would be wide ranging. It would be sparse local and it, you know, so you see it would be a specialist. I got that all of our species are specialists, the hoary willow, the tubercled spike rush, et cetera. So that's, that was my analysis, but it's open to, it's open to criticism. Here's a couple of, here's a, a group of authors that looked at marine mammals, sorry, marine, yeah, I think they're marine mammals, over 500 million years in the fossil record and found that for their uh, vulnerability or their um, resistance to extinction, the geographic range played a primary role in determining whether they went extinct or not. Habitat breadth was a secondary role. Local abundance had little effect. So it was geography, how broad the range was. The habitat breadth, whether they were specialists, this was what was determining whether they went extinct. And here's where we can help. If something has a very narrow geographic range, like the Eastern Mountain Havens and doesn't get around much anymore, maybe we should be helping those species in order to make them not go extinct. We look at the small geographic ranges of um, Nova Scotia species and just some of them and their vulnerabilities. I put the Eastern Mountain Havens here from, uh, from a past um, thought process as a generalist because it can do the sides of roads, but very sparingly. And it does do different things in the White Mountains than it does in Nova Scotia. But take this as, as it is. Um, the Eastern Mountain Avens is vulnerable to wetland alteration, eutrophication. We had that very odd um, eutrophication event where seagulls were using mink food and bringing it to Briar Island. And it's got no dispersal, very poor dispersal. Then we look at the specialists and we look at a group, the broom crowberry and longs bulrush, and it's fire suppression, which is probably their vulnerability. They haven't had fire for a long time and they need it to reproduce. Plymouth gentian, hydroelectric damming, as the pink coreopsis. Eutrophication comes in here as well. So these are some of the vulnerabilities that different species have. So rare species as habitat specialists, they're de defining key landscape processes. And we could go through these different guilds and say we've got a group of Appalachian deciduous herbs that are in river floodplains where the calcium values are high. That's work David Garbery and I did. The coastal plain herbs, that's a guild. They're high watershed area lakes, oligotrophic. So we've got to watch out that they, uh, we keep these lakes and rivers, not just for ourselves, but think of the YWCA camp that once was on Lake Fanning and with the mink pollution, that um, YMCA camp, um, we lost all of that recreation and cultural value. The Pine Barrens organisms in Nova Scotia, Longs Bulrush, we might put Juncus kaiserensi, Ruth uh, Newell's find into this fire prone fens, the sand plain heathland or the sand barrens when it, they need fire and the Black River bog, calcium rich boreal fens. All of these identify processes and restoration goals. And that's important that they're identifying restoration goals. And this is how we approached the restoration of Big Meadow Bog. That we knew what the, the rare organism needed. It needed the lag's hydrology. The lag is the edge of the bog where the swamp is giving water to the edge of the bog. It needed the water to be kept a low concentration, but it needed calcium coming off the salt. So we knew we couldn't move it to any bog in Nova Scotia or that any bog, if it dispersed into any bog in Nova Scotia, that it would do any good. So by understanding the plant, we understood how to manage and restore the ecosystem. And we're still working on this. And this is what I was talking about, how the swamp surrounds this. This is a cross section, a crude cross section on that bog and showing the waters coming off the basalt 
and there were little there were little liverworts that were determining that that water was clean and calcium rich and they were it was a rare liverwort identified by Tom Neely and then we got to a, a lag which was a particular habitat where the eastern mountain avens grow so that's how we went about restoring that system so rarity um, if the ecosystem is fully functional, then you get rarities. There's no warning lights on the dashboard and there's rarity. She, Shayla Nickerson and I were um, looking at, at swamps for OECM potential, that is other effective area based. Yeah, you, you get what I mean. These are other ways of protecting um, organisms. Um, habitats which have a, are available, they're protected, but they're not protected areas. And we were looking at some of these. And when we started getting into these lovely red maple peatlands, lo and behold, we found again the southern Twayblade. The ecosystem was fully functional. And this gives us one more layer to protect that um, ecosystem and to say that it really is something good to protect. I got a contract in 20, we'll say 2015, 2016 from the Halifax airport to analyze a bunch of data. And they had put in a de-icing facility and Ruth Newell had said, oh, hold on, this has the Southern Tway Blade and it's extremely rare. And it was at that point, now it is an S3, but it's still rare. And by the time they put that de-icing facility in, at the edge of the uh, at the edge of the wetland at the edge of this de-icing facility. So imagine you've got a lot of pavement, um, salts coming off it, and the edge of that fen became cattails. The control soon lost its control value, and it too lost its east, its, its southern tway blade, and round. 2010, they had to put in a far control even further away, 100 meters away from their edge, because the wetland function kept going down. The ecosystem integrity kept getting, kept getting, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, kept being lost. And so when we analyzed this, instead of saying edge control and far control, we said the disturbed zone, the swamp edge, which you can see started getting undermined. These pits are very, uh, very indicative that there's watering up of this ecosystem and the swamp interior 100 meters away. And we found that the water table was getting closer and closer to the surface as the ecosystem came apart. And that the southern tway blade, it's called Neosha, these are the these are the bars showing how abundant it was in this one quadrant in 2005, 2006. And then it goes down to nothing. And it became like the, the, blue, uh, the blue parrot. Um, Sean Hicks, who was working for us, says, well, maybe it's, um, it's on cycles, that uh, it's now in a down cycle, and it's going to come bounce back again, like the, like the blue parrot in the Monty Python strip script. And I said, no, if you look at all of these, there's a very strong 90% regression that these, well, with time, these things are on the way out. And what was happening was the, we were losing the integrity of the swamp. It was loosening up. We were getting a series of different annuals, first gravity dispersed annuals, and then wind dispersed annuals. And the rare plant had left the building. But what was interesting was, look at this. The sphagnum cover in the disturbed zone had gone down to very low levels, 12%. In the interior, it was still 90%. There was an exposure of fine roots. And these are the ones that have the mycorrhizae. And at the edge, these were exposed. In the disturbed, they'd long since rot rotted. There was low exposure of roots in the interior, which was still holding on. The fungal bio, the fungal diversity was high in the interior of the swamp. And that got us thinking. That got us thinking that the, as the water table changes, this is number four, water logging stresses the black spruce roots and the ectomycorrhizae. You get a decline in the tree root health and you lose the energy flow to the mycorrhizal community. 
And so we came up, and I won't go through it, we came up with the disturbance cascade. The idea is that when you have rarity, the lights are all green, there's no warning lights, and when you lose the rarity, the rare organisms are first to go. These are your indicators that things are not right when you're losing them, but when you've got them, the lights are all green and there's no warning lights. They're also, rarity is also the guidepost to the restoration of ecological function. So that's rarity. And if you look at, if you don't believe me, look at the flip side, look at invasives. And in the case of invasives, the warning lights are saying on the dashboard are saying something's wrong. We've got trouble. It's either nutrients and runoff from agricultural fields, or in, this, in the case of Southwest Nova Scotia, it was, uh, it was mink ranching. Disturbance, the loss of trees. Think about all of the agricultural land which has now been abandoned, but we have also abandoned the maintenance of that landscape. And who do we blame when the invasive species come in? You've heard me talk about this before. We blame the invasive species, but they are indicators in their own rights in many cases. And I think there's even data to indicate that in invasive fish, that there has been disturbance in the system. Not always, but look for it. Here's an invasive we've just found, and this is hot off the press. I think Shayla put it on, on iNaturalist yesterday. It's the Himalayan blackberry. And this is, um, this is now in Yarmouth. It's going down the rail trail. And we're saying that this is something in Southwest Nova Scotia that we should be aware of and we should nip it in the bud, even though it gives the most amazing blackberry pies, uh, very easy to pick. Uh, you see what it's done on the West Coast. It, uh, it actually doesn't come from the Himalayas. It's more of a, um, of a Eurasian species. And on the West Coast, it makes river, river banks um, impenetrable. If you're tipping your canoe, you can't get rescued because you have to go through um, 20, 20 meters of three meter high um, blackberry canes, which are, which are just lacerating. But it's in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Where? In high disturbance areas, in areas where we manage the town waste, and it came in unbeknownst to people just because um, it was extremely valuable for fruit. But the downside is it's going to overtake riverbanks if we let it. So that's just a quick run through. And um, thanks for listening. I'm still hooked on rare species and also invasive species. But we're also doing some, um, not that that's not serious, but we're also doing some uh, other work in Southwest Nova Scotia, we're looking for uh, OECMs and uh, many of you have been helping us with that project. I'm working with Shayla Nickerson and David Solos and the board of the Southwest Nova Biosphere Association, uh, Reserve Association, that's quite a handful. And um, yeah, look forward to uh, hearing any comments. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Nick, for the wonderful presentation. At this point, are there any questions from anyone in our audience, be that on Facebook? You can either turn your mic on or you can type it in the chat box there if you have any questions. I think Jane's still eating. No, <laughs> I finished, Nick. I finished chomping. Um, I, I just wonder, I don't know if everyone on the call knows what OECMs are. I wondered if you could explain a bit more about I wish I wish what, Shayla Nickerson was on the call. Maybe she is. And even in terms of what what you're looking for, <laughs> you know. Oh, I will give you. I will give you. So, what we're looking for is we're looking for areas in what we're pr primarily in what we call the buffer region of the of the biosphere reserve. It doesn't have to be. We're looking for areas that have protection. And it could be areas around water, um, 
you know, uh, municipal water reservoirs. It could be areas on, in, in military bases. It could be areas that have protection, but they're not protected areas. It's all part of the federal government's uh, drive to reach 25% of protected landscape by 2025. And if you look online, you see that 12% of our protection of the protected landscape comes as conventional protected areas. And 1% there's a column right beside it, which says OECM, which no reasonable person can be expected to know. And that is other effective area-based conservation measures. And so these are things that are protected, but we've never formalized that protection. And what we're in the process of doing is trying to identify such regions, which are already protected, but have gone under the radar, and present them to the Department, Nova Scotia Department of Environment and Climate Change, David McKinnon and, um, and Claire, and um, um, sorry, and Alice, and have them run through these and see if they meet the protection and see if they meet the, the level of integrity. And we've been talking a little bit about uh, integrity. Are there rare species there? Are there exceptional characteristics? Uh, are they a representative of a landscape which um, we haven't uh, protected yet? All of these things go into the mix. And the first screening will be done by the Department of Environment and Climate Change in Nova Scotia. Uh, Jane, would you like to add anything more to that? No, that's that's great. I just uh, I thought it was worth explaining it more fully. Absolutely. And and I guess one other question I would have is, are you know, for the people on this call, is there anything that they can do to contribute towards that if they, you know, in terms of reporting rare species on iNaturalist or, you know, if there are special areas that they know about that that others might not know or you might not know about? I'm not sure, um, Jane. I mean, I know that you are keeping those data. And I know that we've been tasked with um, doing an analysis of where biodiversity hotspots are. We've been talking with um, Kiara at, um, um, who's doing KBAs, um, key biodiversity areas. And so we're going to be putting that into the, the choices for why we're interested in some OECMs and not others. Uh, we're also interested in connectivity. You know, I was looking at the, and I don't know how feasible this is, I was looking at the, um, the distribution of moose in the old Mike Parker um, uh, recovery plan and realizing that there are these clusters. There's uh, 150, we'll say, moose in the center, and then we have other regions. You know, is there a way of connecting those? Do we know enough to do that? Um, are we driving them into roads? That's um, another consideration. So, yeah, there's a there's a there's a there's a lot to it. Thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. It's just it's something that I think not too many of us know much about. So it's it's really great to which find the, out more. Uh, which, is, which is just uh, oh, <laughs> OECMs, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're working we're working with municipalities. And we've got uh, ongoing conversations with um, with Barrington. We've just started talking with uh, with, the, with the town of Middleton. Um, we're trying to get in touch with with Yarmouth, um, Digby, um, Jonathan Riley. Um, so we're we're reaching we're reaching out, but we're not reaching out in a in a land grab way. I hope we're reaching out in saying that. You know, this is part of our mandate from Environment Climate Change Canada. And if this works for you to formalize protection, then, you know, we'd love to help you. And yet, if you don't want to go down this route, that's good too. And so, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to, or we are taking, I'm hoping, um, you know, a cooperative, um, you know, a, co a cooperative um, way of doing things. And the idea, the, the larger idea is that the biosphere reserve will be, the association will be a way of sort of promoting Southwest Nova, promoting Gaspawick, promoting sustainable development. And 
you know, and industries that meet that standard. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions at the moment? I have another one if nobody else does. What about the Go Blackberry? Ahead. You want you want some of that Blackberry? <laughs> no, thank you. No, I'm quite happy with my glossy buckthorn. Um, yeah, I was, I was actually, I see Sylvie's got her hand up. I'll let Syl Sylvie go first because I've already asked my question. So, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Sherry Thorburn Irvine. Uh, Sylvie was, is a citizen of Jordan Bay and she kindly shared uh, her link with me. So she's also on, uh, but, but I'm actually using her link also. So, um, what is your process um, for sh um, involving uh, municipal districts, as you said, uh, Yarmouth and Barrington? I, I happen uh, to be a Sandy Point resident, but also a councillor uh, for districts, Perfect. which is uh, Jordan Bay, Jordan Ferry, and Sandy Point. Um, so what is your process for reach out? It's, 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 so I'm not talking to Sylvie, I'm talking with... Sherry. Sherry, it the process is reaching out. <laughs> you know, is uh, and we've been uh, we you know we've been busy with many many things, and we uh, you know we we get it in our minds. Oh gosh, we haven't gotten in touch with them. We better get in touch with them. So it's yeah. informal, and we want to keep it informal because we don't want to sort of send out a mailing list and say you know if you're interested, please uh, check the box. So. We'd love yes. to. We'd love to. Shayla and I would love to have a conversation with. Um, it, what district are you, Jordan? Uh, so I am District Three. Um, the municipality has seven districts. So District Three is Sandy Point, Jordan Bay, Jordan Ferry. Right. Um, now I'd like to ask this question uh, yeah. of you because, um, and again, thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, you know, when you reach out to uh, you know these levels of government. Um, yeah. Um, shall we answer the question, what's in it for us? Yeah, so, no, that, that's, 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 that's the first thing, you know, there's got to be something in it for you, because I'm feeling, I'm relevant. feeling a little reticent, you know, it's sort of saying, oh, you know, we've been charged by the feds to, to get yeah. land, give us land, lots of land, but, you know, we don't, we, one of the things in the presentations that we've been making, and we're, you know, we're, we're a bit slow off the mark, but not that slow because we only started in May. One of the things, you know, we're saying is that this is not, you know, this is not contractual. It's not that because you are part of the Biosphere Reserve doesn't mean that your land is in any way obligated. It, and, right. and that's, a, that's, a, that was, um, you know, a clear uh, misconception with, uh, with some people. They, you know, they were thinking, oh my God, we're part of this organization and we didn't know it and what are the implications for our land base so so for buy-in so yeah. nicholas i i just want to uh, re-emphasize the point i don't think i've landed it yet uh for buy-in on any municipal unit um you know the behind the scenes uh mindsets yeah. may be uh what is it in what where's the relevancy for the municipal unit yeah. i yeah. think you're doing excellent work but but how do we land that yeah. uh, with a council um, in its entirety? And I guess the point is, is one of relevancy. Yeah. Um, how, how do we strike that with well, a general council, whether it's Barrington or Yarmouth, or yeah. let's say uh, the municipality of the district of Shelburne? Well, part of it, you know, part of it is, as you say, what's in it for the municipality. And if it's an area around, a water reservoir, obviously, the municipality already wants that protected. And so by strengthening that protection, having it written down in stone, as it were, yes, that not that not that you can't get out of it, but that it's an opportunity to come together and to get to set some ground rules. It's also an opportunity that once you've got those um, pseudo protected areas, they are protected areas, that it, you know, it lifts the municipality's um, profile. And so the, nice. idea, the overall idea is, well, not just that you're protecting the 
the landscape from nutrients or um, you know you're protecting clean water but that you're attracting um, ecotourism i mean that's part of it you know you it could be um, it could be recreation you know that you've yeah. got a you've got a beautiful corridor and you want to designate that as a recreation way which is compatible with uh, ecological processes excellent thank you Thank you. Uh, but, it has, just, but it has to be a win-win. Of course, absolutely. I, I do thank you for that. So uh, can I ask a question to Mr. Hill? Yes, Sylvie. Hi. Uh, so uh, I'm a Jordan Bay resident, and I'm very concerned about uh, the wind farm mills that they want to build here, the comp company uh, want to put. I think it's almost 800 feet tall. And we can imagine the base of that would be very large. And they want to construct that around our wetland or some places in the wetlands. So I'm very concerned to protect that in the inland of the peninsula here. So uh, I, could you help us to identify? Because we want to have a, a good file to present, you know, to, to have big good arguments so is it, uh, is it so um, who is who's advancing the um development abo a i know that it's a company uh, that's a municipality of support with a letter and uh, without co consulting the residents here so uh, we knew that when the, it was done and we try to protect our and it's the wetland but it's our, also our drinking water that's coming from the wetland so we're trying to protect everything you know the environment there so nothing no companies will come back in the future and try to invade the, that, spa, that space so I, th I think we need to have a talk off uh, off camera <laughs> okay <laughs> um, i i have been i've been um a consultant for many years. I was a consultant for 10 years. And sometimes these processes, sometimes these processes can work. Uh, there was a there was a wind farm in oh Canso. And they sent me in to delineate the wetlands. And James um oh sorry um we know James James Churchill and Jim Jotcham and I uh, delineated the wetlands, and then we we gave though that delineation to Nova Scotia Power, who was the proponent. And I was shocked that um, Nova Scotia Power took our delineation and said, "Oh, okay." Uh, it was Steph. Steph. Uh, Steph was uh, was in, was uh, in charge of the environmental department at that time. She said, "Okay," and then she tweaked the roads and she tweaked the, uh, the, the turbine locations uh, so they weren't in wetland and um, you had a you know you had a decent um, you had a decent development the only thing that I was um, a bit disappointed there was that it could have been it could have been a wind farm um, ecological area and a recreation area and open to the public but they wouldn't go that far and I thought that was a missed opportunity. Yeah, because here the problem, I think it's all about money. So, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. anyway, so we're, we're yeah, trying let's to talk, do our let's, best. Let, 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 let's, let's talk. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know I shouldn't talk about that. No, that's <laughs> good, that's good. <laughs> but uh, yes, I would like to know how can, can we reach you and talk uh, more about that. Uh, see if you can help us identify some rare species that needed to, needs to be protected and things like that. Yeah, do you, do you think it's possible? Well, there's always rare species. <laughs> yeah, there's I know. There's always rare species. And, you know, seriously, the, um, you know, sometimes the rare species are, um, you know, we think that, that they, and this is the, the, you know, the point that I was getting at, you know, sometimes we think that they're esoteric, but sometimes the fact that you lose your rare species and you lose ecological function, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's why implicitly we protect rare species because they are, you know, sort of placeholders or, or indicators of an ecological function. And Absolutely. when they're not, when they're mm -hmm. not, there's not much reason to protect, you know, I, I, 
one of the re one of the reasons I started thinking this way was occasionally, very very occasionally, you get a rare species that is um, on an old dirt road, and you think, well, what's the point of this? Because it's on an old dirt road, and but. 98% of the time, that rare species is a very good indicator of, um, Absolutely. of ecological integrity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, uh, I approve and I thank you so much. And so uh, I don't know how we can uh, can find me on Facebook, maybe. <laughs> how are we going to how are we going to do this, Jane? Have we got a link uh, to me? On because there? I'm in a committee of, uh, you know, Sandy Point uh, uh, Protection. Uh, there, I don't know the title. We've, we've changed title late, lately, yeah. so uh, yeah, and, uh, to protect Sandy Point. Anyway, that's how it's called. Um, so, uh, and uh, on on Facebook, maybe you can find that. Also, if you're looking for that, and okay. ask me to maybe to have to introduce you to uh, the group, and uh, and uh, maybe we'll have uh, can have a meeting if it's possible. So, if it's, it's it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> it is okay perfect yeah. i'm very happy to hear that no, no promises you, but it's possible yeah okay because I, I found out that you you know a lot about what you're talking about and people need to uh, be educated about that so uh, yeah. Yeah. to be more uh, sensitive yeah, so, and, so still yeah. people, one of the one of you know the the trade-off that um you know, that we're um, we're faced with is um and it's not being wishy-washy. It's the trade-off is that we're trying to find, you know, the the structure of the biosphere reserve is to have a protected area or protected areas, and then around the protected areas have areas where development is sustainable, meaning that it's not impinging, you know, it's not taking away from your um, your natural areas. So it's that it's that balance that we're actually looking for. But when that when that balance isn't there, well then it's not um, you know it's not it's not the direction that the uh, biosphere reserve wants to head. Mm -hmm. So it's a they're delicate they're they are delicate balances. Yeah, I know. I know because I said that because I I, am a, I was working in national parks in, in Quebec so uh, as a naturalist so and I know that everything we would change. We would make a study, impact study of this because of the species that could be there and things like that. So, uh, yes. so that's why yeah. I'm so concerned about and not also, destroying that place. And I, I, you know, I back away from the word dis destroy a bit, but you know the um, the other thing to think about is carbon. You know, right now that a lot of what we're doing on a national level is to find stores of carbon and to protect those stores of carbon. Mm -hmm. So one of the, you know, whether I actually get involved in this or not, but one of the things that um, you should be thinking about is, you know, what is that, what is your wetland as a carbon resource? And what's going to be the impact of a development mm -hmm. on, on that carbon? Because it yes. just, I mean, if you put a wind farm in and you end up um, eating up Thousands, thousands of years of carbon, it's um, it's it's counterindicated mm -hmm. because the reason that you're putting in the wind farm is to control climate change or to to do a better job. And if you're if you're losing carbon stores and you're liberating carbon dioxide, then you're going against what you're um, putting the wind farm in for. Mm -hmm. well, that's very wise. Thank you so much for. Uh... Uh, so uh, I think I know uh, I will let, let other people talk, but uh, I'm very pleased to have the chance to uh, to listen to your uh, what you have to pre your presentation. And uh, well, hope hopefully we can get in touch. Okay. <laughs> um, what we can do is I have put my email in the chat. Um, so you can email me. My name is Chad Simmons, and I work at MTRI, and I can connect you with Nick. Oh, yes, please. I would appreciate it very much. Great. Thank or, you. Or, Nick, can we just put your email sure. address sure. in the yeah. chat? Okay, yeah. I'll do that. Take, take out the, uh, the middleman, save you some work, Chad. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great. While those are being put in the chat, we have a question coming in from 
Facebook that says iNaturalist is an incredible tool. What other resources are available to concerned citizens, scientists to track, monitor, react into invasive species? It's a good question. Um, and um, I'm going to throw it open to, to M MTRI because they probably know a little <laughs> bit more about this than I do. Um, we did have uh, we did have Claire O'Driscoll Wilson um, studying this um, or being a representative of the Invasive Species um, Council, I think. What, what, what was it? It was the Council on Invasive Species, um, Jane, that Claire was doing. And she she's still very interested. Yep, and I don't know. I mean, there, there are so many different projects on iNaturalist that you can contribute to, such as invasive species. And we have a, a herp atlas that we're developing as well, and you can upload pictures. But I think I think you don't actually have to sign into it. Maybe Chad or Morgan know more, than, more about this than me. You don't have to sign into a project for those um, sightings to actually kind of find their way into the right, right project. So don't worry too much about where it goes. Just take a picture and upload it onto iNaturalist. Yeah, I've had a bunch of mine um, moved into the projects just by the project coordinators themselves. It's super convenient. Yeah, that's right. It's a pretty streamlined process now. So including with our Herp Atlas, if you take an observation of any reptile or amphibian in the province, it gets automatically added to the project. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're looking for more information on invasive species, and like habitat restoration and stuff. MTRI has a whole bunch of guides on the topics, including lakeshores and wetlands, Atlantic coastal plain flora, species at risk. So you can always email us and we'll get you some cool guides. Yep, there's a brand new hot off the press inv invasive species guide that um, was produced by, I think it was the Nova Scotia Council for Invasives or Invasives Council. Great. Are there any other questions out there? Oh. I, mean, I, I uh, for, oh, sorry. Sorry. I was gonna, I was just gonna ask one, Nick. And it's it's more of a sort of, I guess, philosophical question yeah. than and, but I know how you like to philosophize. <laughs> um, and it's just the, this, I remember Brad Toms from MTRI did a talk not too long ago on lichens, and he had a like a bar chart that showed the research that had been done on different taxa and you know all the big kind of glamorous species like moose and birds and um, you know flower wildflowers and you know more more obvious species tend to be very heavily recorded because they're easier and more mm. more obvious and easier to identify but things like fungi and lichens and insects are really lacking in data and I wonder how, um, you know, I feel like a lot of our research is sometimes focused on species that we know are rare, but I feel yeah. like, our, yeah. how, what do you know about species that we don't even know that they're rare yet? And often they're kind of foundational species like, you know, um, small plants or, or, um, or insects that are foundational for, they're a good food source for other species. Sorry, it's a big question. I'm just no, rambling. What do, what do I know about it? <laughs> so, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, you know, with the, um, you know, with the, um, with the hemlock um, issue right now. That's you know, that's one of my concerns. Is that, um, you know, I was just at a water, a waterfall um, in near Wolfville with uh, five teenage boys, and as I was trying to make sure the five teenage boys didn't kill themselves off the cliffs um, by jumping into the water. I was just thinking, gosh, here's a hemlock lined, beautiful waterfall. And I can see the, I can see the motivation for protecting those hemlocks. But then each one of those hemlocks is tapped into an invertebrate community that we know, you know, we may not know that much about. So yeah, yeah, the, the links in the system are really important. And I suppose it's when we get to these um, management decisions that that's what spurs the research. You know, like right now, right now I would be doing research into you know, the link between tree roots and calembola and how, um, and how that um, 
you know, how that linked in with other birds, you know, and just, yeah, we need to, we need to understand those links. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question in the comments that asks, Nick, is the nursery still in existence? Is who? Oh, the my nursery? nursery. Yeah. Um, it's not, and, um, but I'm thinking that, uh, you know, we, we now are, we now are, you know, one of these groups that um, is thinking that, you know, there, there may be, there may be grants in, you know, how to, how to propagate native trees and native shrubs. And um, yeah, I think it's still very important because there's a lot of restoration work to do. And right now there's not a lot of nurseries that are doing, um, you know, providing good, either conifers or other deciduous trees or shrubs in, in the native, there's Baldwin nurseries, there's T and D nurseries in, uh, who are really good in, in New Ross. And I haven't been there for a few years, but um, they, you know, they, they're, they're an exceptional nursery, but we need more of these and we need more sort of local, local genotype used because you know, we shouldn't be plugging in. You know, sometimes you'll get a consultancy and they get charged with, not charged, but they, um, they represent their client and you end up uh, restoring an area with, um, with material that comes from New Brunswick or, uh, you know, that's not the end of the world, but you'd like to have local, uh, local nurseries using um, local tree seeds. Yeah, we need it. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, we have another question in the comments. This is from where you spit in the biosphere, your opinion on PIs and pesticide treatments. And who and who and what? On PIs and pesticide Private investigators. What are PIs, private investigators? I'm not sure the context here. Um, um, may, may, may I speak? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Nick, uh, you mentioned hemlock and we know about the woolly adelgid. That's is that right. how I pronounce it? That's how you uh, pronounce it. So, so um, I, I apparently can't spell it. Um, um, so uh, let's. This is a, this is sort of you know I'm I'm trying to paint a big picture. Um, from where you sit in the biosphere, what is your opinion on the use of um, uh, pesticides uh, in for treatment of the hemlock? Well, I think it's you know it's one of these. It's again it's it's a it's a huge trade off. Yeah. And I would, you know, I'm, right now I'm thinking that where we have areas that are very iconic for humans, you know, maybe, maybe where I just was in, um, in three pools, mm. because if we lost all of those hemlocks around three pools, then, you know, a generation of, of kids wouldn't, you know, it would, it would be uh, you know, fairly, fairly run down. If we're looking at the hardwoods and hemlocks in in Kedji, you know maybe that's another one. But I really mm. think there has to be there has to be signage to for the public to say you know these are the trade offs and this is what we're doing here. Yeah, we don't want to go too far down this road because this is the trade off. So and say we are doing it in these you know in these uh, limited in these limited um, uh, scopes. Yeah. Because doing otherwise would um, is is you know is counterproductive. Thank you. But um, I you know I think it's I think you can educate the public, and I'm not saying that in a, in a condescending way. I, I remember going up uh, Mount Mitchell, uh, Mount Mitchell in North Carolina, and they said, you know, where you're about to drive, you're going through you're going through dead um, spruce trees, and these are killed by um, acid rain. You know, it was not apologetic about it. It just, you know, <laughs> this is this is our world. Yeah. This is our world. Let's um, <laughs> let's stop polluting. Um, but these, uh, you know, these invasive insects are are putting a strain on the forests. And yeah. you know, I have, you know, having been down in Appalachia, having um, you know, knowing the diversity of forest. Um, of forest trees that's down there. I have a, you know, I, ha I have um, views on this which are, which are not always conventional. I, I think we should be reaching out to, 
we should be reaching out to Maine and, and be getting some of the trees in, in southern Maine, which are able to cope with Nova Scotia, but mm. won't, be able, won't be able to get here in time. Uh. So I think, I think uh, you know, we, Nova Scotia, southwest Nova Scotia has warmed up 1.7 degrees on the coasts. That's, wow. a, that's, in, that's between the climate normal 1961 to 1990 and the climate normal 1991 to 20, 2020. So wow. that's, that's 1.7 degrees in Briar Island. And this is what was so concerning to us on Briar Island is we're doing all of these restorations of the habitat. And yet we have to, you know, we have to be cognizant that we also may be, um, no, I'm not saying we're wasting our time, but that some of the things that we're fighting against are, cli you know, are climate change related. And so our forests are, start, are going to start getting a little bit loosened up as things get warmer, as insects, as in invasive beetles are taking uh, different trees out as the habitat warms up. So it, you know, it, it might be good stewardship adding to the native diversity on the along the east coast yes given, given that that native diversity cannot move at the same rate as climate change and i think it's something that we know but we we haven't grappled with as um, you know as a, as a, well, i won't say we haven't grappled with it as a province yet but we haven't made it explicit thank you 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 are you excited? Are you excited? Are you overwhelmed? Are you like, you know, I'm both. I'm, both. I'm excited. I'm, I was saying to my friend today, uh, you know, some days to you, yeah, I think we all do this. We go through times yeah. of excitement, uh, and usually that's in the in the morning, and then <laughs> five, five o'clock rolls around and you, you kind of run over a bit. And yeah, you know, no, but I think I think I mean I I mean I think it's silly to I mean and then this is why, you know, I think. I would, I would like to see a lot more youth programs and showing youth what they can do because, you know, if there's a, if there's a, if there's a vacuum, you tend to get disillusioned, disappointed and think, and, you know, having the, thinking that there is no hope, um, there's a lot, exactly. we, you know, there's exactly. a lot we can do in the, uh, in the bottom. I don't know if I'm still, uh, if you can still see my screen, but, um, you know, there's a whole ecosystem, uh, which, We've now realized that uh, we've, you know, we've lost 80% of it's the sand barrens, the sand, uh, the sand, the sand plain heathland, and we know how to bring it back. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of possible, uh, you know, possible restoration that we could be doing. And with some of these programs, like um, I don't know how many billion trees <laughs> say, how many billion trees is it, guys? There's a oh, environment two, Canada, climate change Canada two, program. How many? Still, Two billion, thank you. Two billion, okay. <laughs> if I may just interject and just say one more thing again, you know, Sylvie said it, you are a fantastic, all of you people are a fantastic resource. You know, if we can truly do something in life that makes a difference, and we're on the cusp, and we have been, of course, for a while, but all of us as societies are becoming more, you know, and, and it's also one of our most polarizing and divisive uh, topics, but, you know, I suppose there, you know, there's leading going forward, more opportunities, but education, we all need education. At least that blunts the, um, the misinformation um, that, that, you know, continues to also be out there. Yeah, and I, and I think you're right about the polarization. The polarization, um, to me, I'm trying to, you know, these days I'm trying to head to the middle ground. You know, I started off. Um, I started off more environmental, but um, you know, I'm I'm looking now. I'm looking now at uh, you know how can we how can we do things in Southwest Nova Scotia that are stable? Yes. So when you know when you were talking about the wind farms, I'm thinking you know part of me is saying oh you know yes, don't impact the wetlands, but also yes have wind farms. So how do you how do you find that middle? How do you find that middle ground? And I think that's, you know, well, that's, guess, guess that's what you do. You do. You like this is Sylvie's link. You are talking to the councillor right now, and I. I think there is a middle path. I think there is a win-win, and I mean, it may not be shared with everyone, but I think 
we do need to get our zoning and our updates done to our bylaws um, with community input, with educated citizens, such as our Jordan Bay resident that's on this site that gave me the link tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, let's strike the win-win and protect yeah. our residents, protect our water, our wetlands, yeah. our peat yeah. bogs, our, yeah. our, yeah. Cob our carbon sinks. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually getting goosebumps. So, you know, it is, uh, we need you. We need you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hope we convince you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> and thank you, uh, all of you, because uh, if it was not of you, I, would, I didn't have, wouldn't have the chance to uh, to learn more about the vegetation here and the environment here. So, because I'm new in Nova Scotia, only two years now, so. Oh, it's a, it's a lovely province. Ah, I love it, definitely. Everywhere I go, I, I love it. So, yeah, and the, the people too. It's all package. <laughs> definitely so I want, a very lovely province. <laughs> yeah, so take a good care of it, please. <laughs> it's beautiful. I just want to thank everyone once again for attending tonight and thank you, Nick, for the fabulous presentation. No, thanks, um, yes, thank you. For anyone interested in joining us next Thursday, August 4th, for our next summer seminar, we'll be joined by Dr. Vet Lloyd for their seminar called TikTok, Ticks, Lyme Disease, and How to Protect Yourself. I would like to thank the Region of Queens for supporting us and our seminar series. As always, you can stay up to date with our seminars by following us on Facebook. And if you would like to watch tonight's seminar or any seminar again, you can check out our Facebook Live video or visit our YouTube channel. We hope everyone stays well and we get to see you all again very, very soon. <laughs>